The planet's puppet masters almost surely have a plan There's clearly maybe something there beyond the realm of man And until you thoroughly tested every last close just True, Dr. Sayers. Well. Where would we be without THC? Cause we know they're lying to us, just don't know to what degree. Yeah. Where would we be without THC? The highest side chat show. Greg Carwood Company. All right, higher side chatters. When it comes to what lies in the weird end of the paranormal pool, you'll find hundreds and thousands of experiences that people just can't explain. Abductions, visitations, glowing orb sightings, missing time, telepathic messages, intense synchronicities, altered states of consciousness, and a handful of other experiences in Pandora's box. We've heard about these stories before, but what might have flown a little bit under your radar is just how connected owls seem to be to these odd ordeals. And we can get stranger still because it's the curious crossroads between paranormal and conspiracy that really lights my fire. And from the most hidden symbol on the dollar bill to the towering stone statue at Bohemian Grove, it becomes obvious the owl is of the utmost importance in many of the dark corners we like to shed light on. And it's today's guest, Mike Clellan, I truly have to thank for the big aha moment when it comes to owls because he's written the quintessential book on these strange connections titled The Messengers, Owls, Synchronicity, and the UFO Abductee. Mike is also an avid outdoorsman and a personal experiencer of strange phenomenon, which he's been cataloging on his Hidden Experience blog, along with the strange occurrences of others, for quite some time. And if you want to explore the strange connections between this majestic bird of the night and anomalous events, there simply is no better person on this island Earth to do it than the owl guy himself. A true honor and a pleasure, Mike, my man. Welcome to the higher side. Thank you so much. That was a great introduction. <laughs> Thanks, man. I try. You know, of course, thank you for doing this. I think your work is pretty amazing. It is quite a niche, but it's very cool to be the world's foremost expert on anything, really, especially something like this. And your 400-page uh, book is such a fun read because it's story after story, connection after connection, and you weave so many of your own related experiences throughout. It's quite a ride. But before we get into some of those early formative moments for you, broadly speaking, for people who might not be familiar with the owl's relationship to high strangeness, give us a bit of an overview. How strong is this linkage? Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, this is one thing that I've come up with, uh, that confronted plenty of times where I realized that, what do they call it when you when you try to pitch a movie, right? You know, it's called your elevator speech. You know, you <laughs> got to you gotta give some the talk in less than a minute or something. So that's, I found that that's about impossible to give the, to just, uh, you know, lay it out there and <laughs> give it to you in one, in one. What I can say is that from some personal experiences, and then it's some, you know, book knowledge initially, you know, I'm not the first one to find, note this. I mean, other other researchers and authors have pointed this out oftentimes from their own personal experiences that there is a connection between UFO contact and owls. Mm -hmm. There's two ways to look at that. There's the screen memory. We can talk about that in depth if you want. But for now, the screen memory aspect where let's say someone has a missing time event that they later realize is an abduction. There might be a sort of curious memory related to that, driving down the road at night and seeing a four foot tall owl mm -hmm. and then arriving home and, and they're some hours late. That's very, very common, that kind of story. So when you explore that, you realize that that owl, that four foot tall owl, uh, there's no owl on earth that's actually that tall. Mm -hmm. That account doesn't really, uh, you know, th th that turns out to be, some sort of psychic curtain or psychic costume, let's say, that the alien entity would be projecting into the mind of the observer. Right. Um, that shows up enough times over and over and again. I feel like I feel pretty confident saying it straight up like that. But my interest, my deeper interest, is real owls that show up in the lives of these people. And initially, I had my own set of curious owl experiences. Uh, hit me pretty hard in around 2006. And then after that, I started looking into my own experiences and I would ask people the same question. I would, I would ask, you know, researchers and, and people who've had the direct contact experience, I'd ask them the same question. Have you ever had an unusual experience with owls or an odd experience with owls? And it's not 
but it was enough. There's enough of a pattern there where people say, you know, that's funny. No one has ever asked that. And then they would tell you a story. And the story was often so weird Hmm. and weird in a way that goes beyond the screen memory aspect of it and weird in a way that kind of, I'll jump to the conclusion in a way, weird in a way that makes me think that the present owl mythology, right? So you open up a dusty old book in the library on mythology. It's going to talk about owls. Owls show up in Greek mythology and Egyptian mythology and Babylonian and American Indian mythology and Norse mythology. These owls show up and they all have this similar theme that they bring a message, that they're messengers. Mm -hmm. And my sense is that this ancient mythology is continuing right now, playing out presently. Most, I mean, the most of the documentation in the book is about the UFO abduction aspect of it. But I find that it's also showing up in people who meditate or people who are in shamanic initiation, like the process of working to be a shaman or people who have, have a loved one who has died. So owls show up in other aspects of highly charged human experiences. I mean, obviously a UFO contact experience is a highly charged human experience as is the death of a loved one, as is deep meditation, as is shamanic initiation. So these other realms also share the owl as, a, let's say, a totem animal. And so what I did in the book, I think, and what I wish I could do in an elevator talk, I can't, I wish I could, is just tell stories, and often story after story after story, to prove my point. I maybe overdid it a little bit in the book, and then do a little bit of speculation, and then see how these all these stories kind of link together, because I feel that there is a connecting thread with all these accounts. Mm-hmm. That's a pretty good summary, man. And I, I do think I agree that it's the totality of these instances, these tales that really get you to think, wow, there must be a connection here, some kind of mechanism behind the abduction phenomenon, behind glowing orbs even that come up and and the owl. And it is super strange, but there isn't any other animal that is connected to this phenomenon like the owl is. Well, the deer is. I think, yeah, sure, deer show up. In, in, and I think it's funny because people sort of say, oh, what's the next book? And I'm like, well, the next book needs to be the book on deer, but I don't think I want to write it because I just haven't had that many, I haven't had any kind of meaningful deer experiences. But people have. So there's a, there's a uh, you know, deer is also a mythic animal, shows up all over the place in all kinds of, uh, it has a different symbolism. It's not as foreboding, obviously, as an owl. And the true a deer is not as intimidating as an owl. Um, so yeah, so there are other animals connected with this, and deer would be the, the 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 you know the one two on the top of the list, and then you could go down the line, and things like cats and things like that show up too. So interesting, yeah. I, I've heard from your previous interviews and stuff. You mentioned deer, and it kind of surprised me. Cats, I see though. You mentioned uh, I think it's Oliver or Oscar the cat in the book. This cat who uh, stayed at a hospital and could tell when people were going to die. He would spend time in their room the day before they died. I've had my cat stare at weird things in the room. I know you wrote about that too. It's weird. Animals seem to be able to see beyond the veil. At least some species of them can see beyond the veil in ways that we can't. And that's the mythology. I mean, that's absolutely the mythology. That's the, what owls do. They see into the darkness. They see into the nighttime. I mean, that's a, mm-hmm. that's a, that's a fact, right? That's like, you know, any owl biologist could tell you exactly the reasons why and how they see into the darkness. But ancient man would have known the same thing just from observing an owl. Yeah. And from that is born the mythology of owls seeing into the darkness that very quickly becomes a metaphor for seeing into other realms. Now you take that one step further, the owl has to travel to those realms. They fly into the darkness, something we can't do. You know, and I think that I think that we live in an era with the electric light bulb. Mm-hmm. You know, just a few generations ago, there was no such thing as that. So nighttime must have had a very different meaning to our ancestors, and not even our ancient ancestors. So the owl would fly into the darkness, a realm we are very uncomfortable with, very poorly equipped to travel in. But the owl is very skilled at traveling in the darkness. They would travel to this other realm, but then the next step, the next logical step would be they have to return they have to come back and they with them they would bring a message and and it, you know i would get these reports and i mean i've got oh, geez i got th- i don't know how many reports in some form or another i've accumulated on this owl thing i don't think there's a way to actually count them because huh. some of them are a little more anecdotal and some of them are very thorough but the amount of times that people have just said it straight up long before i you know 
coined the, the title of the book, they would say, well, the, you know, this messenger arrived at my windowsill. You know, I, you know, then I came home from work and there was a messenger on my doorstep, you know, and they would tell about an owl being there and they would use the word straight up without any prompting from me. I love it, man. And let's get into some of those stories. Tell us about maybe some of the strange events that brought you down this path personally, some of the things that happened. Where did this all start for you? Well, so in 2006, I was living out West. I would have been 44 years old, I think. And I was living near uh, Grand Teton National Park, beautiful place. And I was doing a lot of camping. So I would go out for one night and it was very normal for me just to go out for one night, sleep out under the stars and then, and then come back. It was a beautiful, I lived close to those pristine, wonderful wilderness environment. And uh, I met a young woman and she had been living in the area all summer long. And I said, oh, you must have been doing a lot of camping. And she said, no, I never camped once. And I was like, oh, that's terrible. Let's go. So I took her out camping for one night and uh, we didn't bother to bring a shelter because just the weather report and the, you know, the weather patterns, there was no reason to, it would have been, you know, it was going to be a beautiful night. So, so I think it was either the end of September or very early October, I think it was actually very early October of 2006, you know, we hike into the mountains and I am, I've been, I taught for an outdoor school for a long time. So I'm very comfortable in this environment. So I'm sitting on a big flat rock and I'm making dinner and she, she says something. And I'm, I think to myself like, wow, you know, this was a stranger in a way. It's like this first date in a way. And, you know, it's a complete stranger. Mm -hmm. And she says a few things and we're talking and I'm like, I think to myself, this is really incredible. I didn't expect this. I was impressed. It was a depth to her that I didn't, didn't expect. And then at that moment, an owl flew over and then a second owl. Hmm. And then a third owl flew over and, and these owls flew around us as the sun set and the moon rose and we're in this beautiful environment. They would land on branches near us and they would swoop down low right over us. And so these three owls just hung out with us for the next couple of hours and the sun went down and we laid our sleeping pads out on the ground and we laid on the ground and looked straight up at the big starry skies. We were up high in the mountains. So the, the, the skies are astounding at that latitude and that elevation. Mm-hmm. And for just one second, the, the, the stars would be blotted out. You know, it happened silently. I always fly very quietly. And it was a really magical, powerful experience. And the next day we walked out and we were both on fire. Like, oh, that was the coolest thing ever. Like owls. Oh, my gosh. So I said to her, like, listen, if I ever go camping, I'm going to give you a call. And she said, great. And so four days later, I, we went camping again. So we went to a different part of the mountains and walked in. And it was a little colder this time. And it was cold enough that when it came time to go to bed, we took a shelter this time, took a little tent. And uh, I said, let's walk up that hill and, and just, we'll generate some heat by walking uphill and watch the sunset. We can come back down and climb in the tent and we'll be warm because it was just felt like it was a little bone chilling just to hang out. So we walk up this, this gentle hill. It's a big wide open vista and uh, it takes about 10 minutes to walk up. And then we get to the top. And as we get to the top, this owl lands on a branch. And then a second owl flies around us. And this third owl lands right at our feet. And this is the same person four days later, and it lasted for about, I'm going to say about 45 minutes. And this time they got really close, like astoundingly close. And these were real owls. I talked about the screen memory aspect. I was well aware of UFO reports and UFO. I'd been reading UFO books at the time. So I knew about the screen memory thing right in the moment. I was thinking like, oh gosh, you know, and these are real owls. But right in the moment, I also had another thought, which was very clear. And I didn't say it then, but I'm saying it now this voice in my head said, this has something to do with the UFOs. And I had throughout my life had a handful of experiences, um, some in my youth and some as a young adult that certainly seemed to imply or indicate like UFO contact. I mean, the textbook stuff you would read in a book by Bud Hopkins. I had those experiences. I ignored them. I denied them. But when I saw these owls, close up real owls, uh, this voice in my head said, this has something to do with the UFOs. Hmm. In the aftermath of that, a few years later, I started an online blog. Mostly what I was writing about initially was my synchronicities, which I've had a lot of. And they make for perfect little blog posts, right? You know, they're just kind of short. You can tell them. they got a nice little punchline, so they're perfect for a blog site. Sure. What happened was when I – one of the first stories that I put on on the site was the story I just told with this woman, Kristen, of seeing the three owls two times, four days apart in different parts of the mountains. So I wrote that up as an essay, and, and then it – I, I reached out to her and I called her up. She had long since moved away from the area and I hadn't been in touch with her in a while. And I called her up and we talked on the phone and, and I said, you know, Kristen, I have to ask, what were you talking about the very first night when the very first owls appeared? And she said, oh, I remember exactly what I was talking about. I was giving my deepest, most heartfelt definition 
of what God meant to me. Hmm. And that took an already powerful magical experience and just tipped it into the transcendent. And I have to say that I treated the subject differently after she told me that. Like I recognized the power in what she was saying. And from that point on, I, I took the study and the documentation of this fairly seriously. So that so it's been going on for, you know, that was 2009 when the blog started. So that was been eight years now that I've been actively studying, researching this one little small corner. And I've just been astounded at the, at the bottomless pit that it is. Right. You know, you would think that you would just collect a few reports and write up a little, you know, three page blog post and be done with it. But that's not how it played out. It is, it has had a depth that just left me astounded. <laughs> Yeah, man, it, it is quite a rabbit hole, and real owls are definitely interesting, but when we look at the stories in the more mystical perceived owls category, meaning visions of owls or seeing them in altered states or even these screen memories from abduction experiences you mentioned, as different as they can be, have you found any major commonalities or conditions that unite those type of strange experiences? Well, I know that people have taken, you know, mushrooms and, and there's a woman in the book, her name is Shauna Holm and she's a shaman. She lives in the, uh, out the West Coast and she wrote about a, an experience with a white owl that she um, encountered while under a, what's referred to as a heroic dose, five grams of mushrooms. Cheers to that. Yeah. So, she, I mean, you know, with more power to her. Yeah. So, so she, she, you know, had an experience, her first experience doing, usually when you're doing this, there comes a point when the initiate who's working with a mentor has to break away and do the, the ceremony on their own mm -hmm. without the tutelage or the tutor alongside. So when she did that, she, she said she was confronted by this huge white owl. She said her, she was in her bedroom. She said the entire interior of the bedroom turned to white feathers and she saw this giant, like she described it like seven foot tall owl, you know, in her room and the owl said to her, is you are no longer woman who yearns. You are now woman who knows. And in a way, that is the transformation, that transformation from yearning to knowing, or let's say yearning to being comfortable with the unknown. That may be a better way to put it, because I don't think anyone truly knows the core of what's truly going on with this stuff. But some people are are more comfortable and can navigate the waters a little better. So her account, I, um, and I later got her on the phone. I'm like, listen, have you had any UFO experiences? Say, yeah, it's funny. You should ask. I just had one recently. And she described this thing where she's lying on her back and there's this, you know, shiny disc up in the nighttime sky and her and her friend both see it. And they're like, oh my gosh, we're seeing a UFO. So, so when I asked her, she could honestly answer, yes, she had had a UFO experience. Though I don't necessarily put her in the category of UFO abductee, but I put her in this gray category of someone who has the same transformative experience that a UFO contact would have, and also this powerful experience with owls. Now, this woman, Shauna, her account came on a Monday. And then on Tuesday, I get a follow-up account from another woman. And her name is Lori. She's just given me permission to use her real name. Her real, her, name, her pseudonym in the book is, is Leslie. And she you know, basically had the mother of all owl stories. So her account is that her son, who was about nine years old at the time, was showing signs of like being psychic. And this is a woman who was very comfortable and at peace with her own experiences with being having UFO contact. So her son is showing signs of, you know, psychic stuff. So she sits in the backyard and says, well, let's play some games. Okay, let's try some dice tosses. You know, guess what the next dice is. And then they got a deck of cards out. Guess what the next card is going to be. And the boy was doing really well. And during this, during this class, an owl shows up on a branch, this white owl. And then it hangs around for the next three years. You know, they get in the car and they go to the grocery store and the owl flies with them to the grocery store. And they get to the grocery store and the owl's on a lamppost and they go into the grocery store, they do their shopping and they leave and they come home. And on the way home, the owl follows the car back home for three years. This goes on. Um, there comes a point when they, when this woman wants to leave to become a hypnotherapist. So she has to move and take some classes. So she takes her son and her, and they leave and they leave this house where this owl is. And the day after they leave, they get a phone call from their neighbor and they said, you know, 
you know, Laurie, I have some terrible news. You're white owl. We found it dead in the backyard. Hmm. So, and this woman has other owl stories that are equally remarkable. And, and this is a woman who, unlike Shauna, Shauna the shaman who saw the six foot tall visionary owl on tripping on mushrooms, this woman is very, very straight up about her UFO contact experiences, the woman Lori. Now, so I get this one call on a Monday, one call on a Tuesday. Here are these two stories back to back. They're both the same age, Lori and Shauna. They're both adopted, hmm. which is very strange. They're both born in Ontario, Canada. They're both, I mean, they're not sisters. That was the first thing that crossed my mind. It's like, oh my gosh. Um, and then they, and I will also say both of these women have very striking blue eyes. Now, and they both had experiences with owls that both women are now working as therapists, one in a very traditional setting, counseling, family counseling, doing hypnosis, the other one in a more, let's say, esoteric realm, therapist through and in the role of shaman. So there's a power to me. These two stories are related, not only in, in the details, but in the fact that they arrived within 24 hours of each other. So this, so there's all, so the, the title of the book is Owl Synchronicity in the UFO Abductory. So, so this, this synchronistic aspect is something that, um, you know, like as I was working on the, on the book, I felt like I was on a boat on a, on the open ocean. Right. And I was just kind of being my compass was was leading me wherever it wanted to lead me. Like I had I had no sense of direction at all where I needed to go. But I, I depended on this compass to lead me, you know, in the open waters where there was no there was no markings to find my way. Mm -hmm. And so I just trusted the, the, the compass of synchronicity. And um, and this is a perfect example of the story I just told these two stories back to back. To me, the most important part of those two stories is their connection coming 24 hours apart. Yeah, man, that is interesting. And synchronicities, I just love how they come through layer after layer. And when you see how deep they stack up, it's got to make you wonder if something else is pulling the strings. And the similarities between those two women, that kind of reminds me of the stories I've heard where Irish people say that they can see fairies or mystical creatures that others can't because of some genetic component, which comes up in the abduction scenario too. The idea of a bloodline connection that it's this multi-generational thing. And I don't know, but there does seem to be a certain kind of person that is more susceptible to these things in the paranormal realm. Um, there, you know, so yeah, so that would be like the, the, the synchronicity prone individual. I think that's actually a term used by, uh, there's a researcher, there's a couple of researchers who, who use that same term, uh, synchronicity. The one is Dr. Kirby Surprise, who I write about in the book at length. Yes. And the other is a researcher named Gibbs Williams. Both of these guys would be great interviews for you. Mm -hmm. And Gibbs says something similar, you know, like synchronous, you know, a synchronicity prone personality. So there's people who are prone to these things. And I think that, you know, there are people who are obviously prone to UFO abduction. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a point in early on in UFO research where if someone saw two UFOs, you would say, well, this is ridiculous. You know, statistically, it's impossible that two people would, you know, or one person would see two UFOs. So you would take their reports and you would crumble them up and throw them in the wastebasket. But now we're finding it's exactly the opposite, where you talk to someone who's seen a UFO and you corner them a little bit and then you realize that they've seen 10. Right. You know, so the people who are having these contact experiences, it doesn't happen just once. It, it's an ongoing thing. So you know, like synchronicities and like abduction, these things are reoccurring. I think everyone can experience a synchronicity and I'm quite certain everyone has. I think it's the, the awareness. And then I would say, I, I spoke to this wonderful woman. She's an abductee. I spoke to her at a conference and she, she told the story about one synchronicity that led to another and she was very animated and she was actually like pulling, right? So she was standing there and she's pretending like she's pulling, like pulling on a big rope, right? And she's pulling it towards her. So I follow the synchronicity and I pull on it and it leads to this other synchronicity. And then she says, and at the end of this rope is your destiny. Hmm. And I thought that was so wonderful. So yes. Yeah, so I think that the, if you are aware, you can trust synchronicity. You can use synchronicity like a, um, you know, like you would use the advice of a, of a life coach. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Poetic, man. I'm with you. And I'm drinking a lot of coffee. I'm jacked up on coffee right now. So I've got the, <laughs> got the synapses are firing really well right now. Beautiful. Beautiful. So I I find the, the screen memories aspect to be just super interesting. And we talked a little bit about stories where people 
see UFOs and also see owls. You have stories in the book where people see orbs and then also see owls. But there seems to be some overlap in an area where people see grays that maybe turn into owls or orbs that turn into owls, or they see four foot owls that might be some type of screen for a gray that they're actually seeing. That's a really strange area. I mean, do you, th do you think there's some type of intelligence hiding behind the owl facade, perhaps? Well, our, there's certainly an intelligence. Yeah. So, so here's one story. So, um, I mean, the typical story is the one I told earlier. You know, someone sees a four foot tall owl and then they get home and then there's missing time. And I have that story in one form or another just so many times it would have done no good. <laughs> like I could, I could, we could do this whole thing. I could just tell one account after another, after another and fill up two hours and then two more hours. Mm -hmm. But, um, so here, this, this woman, she's a young woman at the time. She's, she's in her forties now. At the time she was 19 years old and she was at working at a summer camp for girls. So she is walking between, like basically just between two parts of the camp, right? So she's like on a little path and she can hear girls in the background and she's just walking along and she comes around a corner, full daylight, full sunshine, bright meadow. She's on this little path, standing next to the path is a gray alien, like full daylight. Hmm. And she had only at that point, she recognized that she had had these contact experiences and felt that they were related to aliens. But here it was full daylight and she didn't... Up until then, every experience she'd ever had happened at night. So she just like is shocked, right? Yeah. And she says she doesn't. She's so shocked that she doesn't stop walking. She like feed her in like autopilot. And she just walk, walk, walk. So she sees this alien. The alien sees her. And then there's this telepathy that takes place in 100% of the accounts. And so she has this telepathic kind of like reverberation like this echo chamber and she hears this being go owl 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 and she watches boom it morph into a four foot tall owl this four foot tall gray being with a bald head and the big black eyes and the skinny body suddenly turns into a four foot tall owl and then she watches this owl turn around and run awkwardly into the woods mm. now I also have an account in the book with deer. So here's a woman. There's a woman. She's at her house. There's a bright flash outside. She's like, that's weird. That was a strange flash. I wonder what that is. So she stands, she walks out her front door and stands on her front porch. And she looks to the side of the porch and then standing right next to the house alongside the porch are four spindly gray aliens, right? The, the You know, the classic, just what I described before, the big head, the big black eyes, the skinny body. She looks at these aliens. They look at her. And then all of a sudden, poof, they turn into four deer and they begin walking backwards and then they walk backwards around the corner. Super creepy image. So those are two accounts, which are rare. It's very unusual to hear those accounts. I've heard uh, a few like that. But what it tells me is that there's some, I mean, I obviously, I don't think that they physically transposed from a, a gray alien into an owl. I think there was some sort of psychic Mm -hmm. curtain being drawn in front of the perceptions of the observer so that the there was it was projected into the mind of the observer that that they were were not seeing something frightening like an owl they were seeing something a little more banal excuse me for, i'm here i do this all the time i get owls and aliens mixed up they were not seeing something frightening like an alien instead they were seeing something a little more benign like a deer or an owl I love it, man. I mean, next time I see either one of those animals, I'm definitely going to give it a nice hard look and make sure I'm looking at the real deal and not some kind of weird facade. Well, there, just so you know, there's like there's a lot of owls out there, right? So people see owls all the time. They're a very common bird. The reason we don't see them, obviously, is just because they're a night bird and we're, we don't, you know, we're not like they, we would we would. They're basically in, hard to see because they, you know, in the forest at night, we're not going to see them, but um, they're out there. Plenty of owls, mm -hmm. lots of, lots of owls. <laughs> yeah. I'll be busy then. And lots of deer too. So if you see a deer or an owl, you know, like, yeah, I mean, you can go through that little checklist, but you know, high, highly probable that you're seeing a real bird or a real, a real animal. <laughs> Fair enough. And you know, you call the book, the, the messengers. And this of course does relate heavily to the synchronicity aspect, but you did mention this trend of people who've gotten these literal messages telepathically in their encounters. Many in the book seem quite personal or kind of cryptic, but is there a common theme among the messages that might give us clues into what or why this is happening? Any kind of agenda behind it? Well, it sounds like something Yoda would say to Luke Skywalker in a yeah, way. You know, I mean, yeah. it's this, yeah, it's like it's kind of cryptic. Yeah, sure. So this one woman, Rebecca Hardcastle Wright, wrote a book. She coined the term 
Exopolitics. I'm pretty sure she was, I think she actually wrote a book called Exopolitics. And I think Michael Sala actually coined the term. So she's very forthright about her experiences. She is very grounded. She's very smart. And she was living in Phoenix, Arizona. She was in a, in like a, just a dumb parking lot at some strip mall in the suburbs of Phoenix. She looks up on a, a light post in the parking lot and there's an owl full daylight huge owl standing up there she looks up at this owl and she gets this telepathic voice in her mind that says you are not who you seem to be which is great like i mean if a script writer wanted to put that into a kind of a mystical movie you couldn't come up with a better line than that right, right. you're not who you seem to be and she felt that she was going to have a visitation that night which she did and then i asked her like was that a real owl she said, I don't think so. I think that was a projection of some sort, which is interesting because it gets to the point where like, you know, like I asked like, okay, did, was that a real owl? And like, people are like, well, you know, like maybe, maybe not. I'm not sure. So there's no easy answers for any of these things. But that was, that's, there's one example of, of someone who got a very cryptic, you know, one line message. And then I have another person who had a long conversation with an owl in the woods. And I would have to refer to my notes to actually describe what that whole conversation was. But, um, the gist of it was exactly the same it was like, you know, I think the initial line was she asked the, the owl, right? So she walks into the woods and she's on a hike and she felt strongly that she was going to meet an alien that day. And then she, her name is Karis and she walks into the woods and she's like, all of a sudden she's like, well, I should leave the path. She walks off the path. Well, I should like walk over here. She climbs over some rocks and stuff. Well, I think I got to sit on this rock. She sits on the rock. Well, no, I need to sit a little over here. No, no, I need a little, you know, a little, okay, over here. This is right where I need to sit. She sits there for a little while. And it's this pretty spot. And then she realizes she's lined up exactly. So there's this, like, the way the bushes are arranged, she can see this owl kind of through this one little gap in the bushes. And she says the great horned owl is a common owl, big. They're one of the larger owls. They could beautiful face. So she has this little stare down with this owl. And she went into the woods fully expecting that day to see an alien. And she says, are you an alien or are you a fairy? She'd been doing all kinds of fairy research at that point, hmm. which is blends, you know, some UFO researchers, if I had said that, then they take my report and crumple it up and throw it in the trash. But so she says, are you an alien or are you a fairy? And the owl replies telepathically into her mind. Why can't I be both? You're both. Boom. Which is, not, again, a great line. I mean, if a scriptwriter wanted to create a, a beautiful, eerie, transcendent mood in a movie, that's the line they would put in the script. So I'm just struck at the, at the power of these stories. Yeah. Yeah. I love that one. Karis Melinda Brown. I had that one highlighted to have you mention because it does have that fairy aspect. She, she would also be a great person to talk to on, on your podcast. She's, she's like, yeah, she's very, she's very well-spoken. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah. That is just one connection that has really stuck with me is old ancient fairy lore and the modern abduction experience and the way that the two kind of dovetail with, uh, you know, people being taken in the night or taking kids or being in a, another realm and not being able to get out. I think, yeah, maybe the alien abduction experience is just kind of a modern techno centric lens on a phenomenon that's been with us since the beginning of humanity, perhaps. I agree completely. I mean, this is all just speculation. I right. have no proof of it that what I have is sort of a, um, a wealth of anecdotal reports, you know, so that's, you know, when I was working on the book, you know, people would, this is, you know, I spent years working on the book and people would say, so what are you up to these days? And, well, I'm worried, writing a book. I'm like, you're kidding. You're writing a book. What's it on? And I said, it's on owls. They're interesting owls. Well, what about owls? And then this is the point when I had to kind of size them up and like, oh, gee, do I open like the UFO thing? Do I like start the UFO conversation? Because if I do, like I'm going to be stuck there for an hour. Hmm. So, so I kind of like have to size them up. And then if I, if I basically, if I like had to like, you know, be on my way in a few minutes, I would say, well, you know, it's a book on mythology. And they, that's very interesting. And what's your, what's your premise? And I said, my premise is that the ancient myths are playing out present day. The ancient owl myths are repeating playing out present day for real people, real experiences, the same way they would have played out for our ancients. The way these ancient myths evolved and emerged, I'm convinced, are based on 
real experiences. Mm -hmm. They might have been visionary experiences, but that's still an experience that can be incorporated into the you know campfire myths around the village. So that was my answer, and I and I hold to that answer, and I'll say that you know the the as I said earlier, you know the the highly charged experience, you know meditation, shamanic initiation, death, UFO contact, being taken by the fairies. These are all highly charged human experiences that lie outside our normal perceived reality. And then for some reason, the owl seems to be the totem of these experiences. Here, I'll give you one story here. There's a fellow, his name is Peter Manns. He's a Reiki healer. He does this very interesting work with spine alignment, very practical kind of kind of stuff. But it's like, a, it's like I don't want to, I want to be careful what years, words I use. I mean, it's like magic in a way. Hmm. So he um, he's a powerful, interesting spiritual guy. And he comes over to our house for dinner. He was in the area. He's from Germany. And he asks the question, so what are you working on? I'm, oh, I'm working on this book on owls. And he kind of interrupts me. And we're standing in our living room. My partner, Andrea, and I share a house. And we're in the living room. And, and he says, um, oh, that's interesting, owls. Because I had a Native American tell me that I had a totem. And my totem was an owl. And it's sitting right here. He puts his hand up kind of near his ear, his left ear. His left shoulder. It's my have an owl sitting on my left shoulder here, and that's what the shaman told me. Now, he didn't know it, but from where he was standing, I had a direct line of sight. So I'm standing in the living room. He's standing in front of me. Behind him is the window, and out on the porch is a totem pole. And at the top of the totem pole is a white owl. And when he put his hand over his shoulder and kind of made the little gesture, like here's where the owl was, his hand was basically petting the head of the owl on the totem pole. So he said, I have an owl as a totem. And he was petting, from my visual sight, he was petting an owl on a totem pole. Like, hmm. that's not in the book. That happened after the book was completed. But it was like, like where do you go from there? You know, I, I, I mean, that is so perfect. It is so clean. And it is also deeply personal for me because I was the only one that saw it, right? I'm the only one that had the, that had the visionary experience of it, his hand lining up with the owl. Yeah, that is an interesting one. I wrote down one of my favorite stories here. It's this woman named Ashley and it's because of the cryptic texts on her phone in relation to the experience. It starts with her UFO sighting where she says, as, as you write, I had to pull over on the side of the road. There was a large flying object hovering in the sky above me. It was making no sound whatsoever and was flying very low. There weren't any flashing lights on it, only a red dangling string that was lit up. There were three cars pulled over behind me, and the guy from the first car was taking pictures. The pictures were unclear. You could only make out the red light. After seeing this UFO, I started noticing some weird things. I started having encounters with owls. Why owls? I have no idea. She also started having strange dreams with both owls and UFOs together. Along with that, she wrote about an odd experience with her mobile phone. Two weeks ago, I woke up to a text from my boyfriend that said, What the hell are you talking about? When I checked my outbox, I noticed four strange texts that I didn't remember sending, and I saved them to my phone. And this is just amazing. Text one. It will identify all planes in the sky, will detect unauthorized flying objects, and will warn them of aliens nearby. Text message two, yes, destroy it. We must hold our ground. Text message three, you will remain undetected. Text message four, they threaten us, but they are weak. Report back to me. And she says, I don't know what these mean. They don't make very much sense. And now that is interesting, man, because I think there's some overlap when it comes to the frequencies of our electronic devices and these other realms. It's hard to nail down, but that story, because of those odd creepy details that seem like fairly intense messages, almost military in, uh, in their nature. But I like that one. Oh, I love that one too. And I got a hold of her and I had a long talk with her. And this, this is like, so, so this woman, she, so, <laughs> so I, it, looked, it took a lot of work to find her. Like, cause this was like a, some little thing and some little report and it was online. And I had to like, you know, to, to figure out who this person was. So I finally got a hold of her and talked to her on the phone. She is now working as, well, it's not quite a shaman, but as she's studying like uh, alternative healing and spiritual healing. 
and I don't know what it means. So yeah, so why is that any different than than uh I mean I mean whatever is controlling reality, right? Whatever is controlling these synchronicities, you know, I I don't think that it it it's a big leap for them to put them on text messages in my upcoming book, the follow-up book that I'm working right now. I have almost a similar story, which is very unusual because there's one thing that's funny here. There's a, there's a spelling error in it. It's not unauthorized vehicles. It's unotherized. Uh. It says we'll detect unotherized flying objects and warn them of aliens nearby. Now that's a great unotherized. I mean, yeah. that's so perfect. Now I have another uh, account where there's, also a single misspelling Mm -hmm. my sense is that perhaps like the secret government could have well obviously they could have sent her some text messages just to mess with her right here's a ufo witness there's plenty of evidence that ufo witnesses have been messed with you know like just very simple things like like uh getting, uh, you know, clicking noises on their phones or their mail being opened. And now well, this is like, come on, it's like, it's like the 21st century. Nobody like needs to hear a click on their phone to like, that's like, I mean, don't you think they would have figured that out how to like tap someone's phone without putting a little click noise on it? Yeah. So, but that's what people are reporting, like this obvious harassment that's like meant to be noted. And maybe this falls into that. Maybe it's paranormal. I don't know. But what is very interesting is, I mean, this she's not like a conspiracy theorist that's going on the David Icke tour, you know, she's dedicating herself to helping people through holistic means, which is also something that shows up over and over again. I, I cannot tell you what I, I mean, when I was doing this research, I just would always do the same thing. I'd have a piece of paper, I'd write down some key things. And then on this piece of paper, I would write Reiki. And then at some point I'd say, hey, what are you doing for anything interesting, doing with any sense of psychic stuff or any kind of you know, and then they would say, well, I'm a Reiki therapist or I'm a Reiki master or, a, you know, and so this just got checked off. I have no idea how to like figure a percentage, but in a way that does not match, you know, like if you just pulled people at random at the shopping mall with the people that I was talking to were that was a consistency of Reiki therapy or hands on healing that was just off the charts. So what does that mean? You know, how do we, I mean, I have one guy, he's a teamster, right? He's a truck driver. He's, he's not like a, he does not fit the new age caricature. Let me put it that way. You know, he's like listening to ACDC driving his truck. You know, he's not listening to, you know, sitting in the Lotus position and listening to Wyndham Hill music. He's, he's, uh, and he said, you know, I got this thing if he, and he's had UFO contact experiences. He said, you know, all of a sudden a few years ago, I just had this overwhelming pull to study Reiki and I became a Reiki master. It seems a little out of context given the person that he's, you know, that you would perceive him to be. Mm-hmm. So where, you know, like, yeah. So where do you go with all this? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm glad you picked that story out. I like that story a lot. And I, and it's funny because I just I, I contacted her when I was working on this updated story in the second book, which also has this odd phantom text message, you know, and and, and I don't have it in front of me, but it's equally as cryptic. And, and I said, like, what do you make of this? And she was just like baffled. She says, I don't know. It is so weird. I have no idea what to think. Hmm. Yeah, that stuff's great because there's a little physical trace of something strange. So this relationship between these experiences and shamanism that we've been talking about, I wrote down a quote that you have in the book from an author, Joe Lewells, I believe. Joe Lewells, yeah, he'd be another person would be great for you to talk to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's no shortage for sure. And you asked him about this shamanism connection, and he said, when it comes to these encounters with non-human intelligences, the people who are having these experiences are many times rather unwillingly being dragged into a shamanic apprenticeship. The people having these experiences are being taught how to heal. Their consciousness is being elevated. They are being given opportunities to help people. Many of them will leave their jobs and then become Reiki masters and massage therapists and hypnotherapists. All of these can be seen as forms of shamanic activity. We need shamans, and if society doesn't provide it, the universe will. And that is so poetic, and it really sums up. Well, I actually got chills just reading that just now. I just I <laughs> literally got the chills. I got... It's great. It is a, a definitely a great little paragraph that sums up, you know, this whole realm. And and I'll say it also doesn't. It doesn't. It sums up the whole realm of the let's say the the tone or the fabric of the of the owl book. Mm-hmm. Um, there's plenty of people out there who have had dark frightening negative experiences that that they see as traumatic and haven't gone down that road that joe lules says but but i mean i i'm 
saying that there's a, a percentage, I don't know what it is, but it's a large enough percentage of people who have had these contact experiences who then go down this road mm -hmm. of helping people. And you are totally right. And th that is what I was going to ask you is that, is there a, a counterpoint, an owl centric counterpoint to maybe the, those more nefarious medical style abductions in any way? Oh, like a totem animal. You know, that's a great question. And I don't think I have an answer for that. You know, in a way, um, you know, that, that this, I struggle so much with this. The woman um, who saw the gray alien along the side of the path and then it watched it turn into a, to an owl. She and I have had long conversations and she, th there's this kind of, which I think is a little bit dangerous and I'm cautious to go down this road where people will say like, you know, it's the energy you bring to it, right? So if you have a negative experience, it's because you have negative thoughts. You're bringing your own negativity into the experience and, the, and it's framing your experience to be that. So if you have wonderful, blissful thoughts, then you'll have these, you know, wonderful angelic experiences. That's a little naive to me and I think it puts a lot of like, and just on a straight, like, you know, blaming the person for their bad experience. I mean, I don't want to go down that road, you know? Yeah. Then this woman who I, you know, who I mentioned earlier with who she basically, we had this conversation. She said, you know, and she summed it up best, you know, like some people are just shit out of luck and they get mm -hmm. the crappy experience. And I don't know why some people get the blissful experience and some people get the crappy, some people get both. And there's also, there's a sense that the experiences themselves, like, I'm cautious to say this because this is this is almost like um yearning this is what I want it to be and I have but I certainly could cherry pick the evidence to make it to make it seem like this is that people start having dark frightening experiences somewhere along the way they come to terms with these things and then they turn into transformative experiences then they fall into that list that Joe Lewis read so so eloquently or that, you know, he just spoke off the cuff and I, and I transcribed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I would actually, I'd like that to be the case, but I don't know some, some experiences that I've heard about, I'm sure you've heard about obviously just as many as me, probably way, way more than me, but some of them seem pretty objectively negative when you're talking about burning needles being put in people's eyes and these kind of things that they do experience some type of pain. Maybe there is a, positive altruistic motive behind that i mean some medical procedures are going to be painful even though there's a positive end result but well and also i'll say so so the, the you know if you want to be a you know if you want to go have a visionary experience and you're a and you're a you know living out in the in the reservation in south dakota you know you go off into the to the plains and you take eagle talons and put them through the skin of your nipples on your chest and, hey and you have your village members you know haul you up and suspend you like that until you until you break free and drop to the ground again i mean that's that's Whew. that's part of the visionary experience in, in the, and that shows up in one form or another in all kinds of you know religious ceremonies you know the catholicism thing where you like you know whip your own back with a cat of nine's tails and i mean so that is not without precedent in a transformative visionary experience that's true so yes so is it i mean are people physically getting needles put into their eyes they very well could be i've certainly read plenty of accounts of that is it some sort of visionary experience is it is it just as symbolic as the four foot tall owl on the side of the road is is something else happening you know so i don't have an answer to these questions but it is to me worth wrestling with mm-hmm Right. Yeah. We're not going to get to a lot of conclusions today, but it's still quite fun. In terms of just the proximity of real owls to orbs and UFOs, one curiosity, you do mention it early in the book, and it seems like you kind of evolved from it, but might there be some type of energy or frequency that we don't recognize that relates to spiritual or alien experiences that owls can sense or are attracted to? Yeah, I mean that's I mean that like so is the UFO, right? So the UFO has all kinds of odd things that take place, right? So you know, UFOs are oddly silent. You know, they make almost they not only do they not make noise, they like suck any available noise out of the environment. So it's not, you know, when people say like, "Oh, this out this UFO flew over my head and it was quiet." They don't say it's quiet. They are they they'll they'll hammer it home and say like the crickets stopped, the crunching of leaves stopped, the you know, the wind in the trees stopped. It was weirdly silent the ufo flies past 
in it, then the, and the sound returns. Now that's very common. So as a, you know, like we could sit at a, you know, with a, with a material scientist who does, you know, work with, with, uh, you know, magnets or something like that. And we could then postulate like, oh, let's say this there, the operating system of the flying saucer is using some advanced technology that distorts the fabric of sound or the fabric of reality in some subtle way that we perceive as silence. Now, if there's any animal on earth that is attuned to have amazing hearing, owls have amazing eyesight, but their hearing is actually considered much better than their eyesight. So they can see into the dark and they can, they can hear a mouse, you know, rustling around on the forest floor a half a mile away. So we're talking about an animal that's, uh, you know, that can fly at night through the trees. They are uniquely attuned to perhaps hearing or sensing or seeing whatever it is that makes these UFOs fly around. Um, you know, my cat in the book I referenced, my cat, you know, sits near the heater, right? So here's a, here's a physical machine. It has a, mm -hmm. it has a measurable output, you know, like warm air comes out of a little vent. My cat has a behavior. It seeks that out and sits near it. Is there something as simple as that going on with the owls? You know, is is the UFO just a glorified dog whistle that attracts the owls? So that's one way to look at it. Now that actually, that's a wonderful avenue of speculation. And I think I exhausted it in the book, but there's more to it because it just gets so mysterious and it just gets so like laden with symbology and, and sort of archetypal overlays at a certain point. Perhaps that might be partially true. You know, my sense is it's less that the, I think that the grand chess player of reality is setting that owl in place near the abductee the same way that I would set a pawn on a different square. That would just be one move in the game. I would, you know, the pawn would then be set alongside the bishop, let's say. That's my sense is that there's the, somehow the fabric of reality is being Oh, manipulated is the wrong term. It's being stage managed the same way you would, you would do it on a, for a theatrical play. And these, these characters are making their appearance and then stepping off the play, off the, off the stage. Mm -hmm. So the owl would make an appearance. You would have a, there's this, there's an archetypal power to these owls. And then they would, they're imbued with some sort of subconscious energy. Now I'm getting way out on a limb here. So, mm -hmm. so, uh, but, the, but I feel they're being in, like an archetype is, is like a, you know, like there are archetypal things, you know, the hero, Luke Skywalker is an archetype. Um, an owl is an archetype. It is imbued with some deeper meaning and that we can sense it almost on a cellular level, like, you know, within our deeper consciousness. And so it, it brings with it a deeper meaning. So an owl landing on a branch happens all the time in the forest. If it happens at a certain point in a certain person's life, at a certain key moment, you know, that that's in, imbued with something more powerful. How it happens, why it happens is all just speculation, but, but it certainly seems to, it certainly does seem to happen. <laughs> yeah. And if we want to really ramp the weird up to 11, I've had a lot of guests talk about the idea that we are in some type of simulated environment or just an environment that is being heavily monitored from a higher level with these oh, absolutely. abductions agree, and yeah. all this stuff. You know, if we want to get really weird, could owls be some type of agents of these watchers of some kind, some kind of uh, liaison, the, uh, some type of uh, information gatherer that seems to be a middleman between those observers uh, and, and us? A biological drone. I mean, there is no animal exactly. more perfectly suited, right? So you, so you, instead of building a little machine, right, you just co-opt the consciousness of a bird that can see in the dark, can fly silently, and that has amazing hearing, yeah. right? So if, it, if I'm having this conversation here, an owl can sit, you know, I'm quite certain an owl could sit 50 yards away from the window and hear every single word I'm saying more clearly than any technological microphone that's ever been invented. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's now we're talking, man, because when you're, when you get into the aspect that grays seem to morph into these things on occasion or even orbs. Now that sounds like some type of biological technology. Yeah, and do I, I don't do I have a story of an orb morphing into a to an owl in the book anywhere? I don't know if I do. Maybe not specifically. Maybe not specifically. But in the proximity. So I thought that 
perhaps there was some overlap. Okay, because I do have a great story with this young guy from New Zealand, and he had been recording. This is another thing that shows up, just people like, oh, you know, I've got all this footage of UFOs. Nobody wants to pay any attention. I've just got one, you know, so he's been collecting all this video footage of, of orbs. And he actually, I have the quote directly in the book. I can't, I'm going to do it paraphrase from my head. Mm -hmm. So he sees this beautiful orbs, goes in the house, documents it right away, sits down at the computer. He sent me a long list of his documentation. It's pretty dry, right? You know, 7.30 PM, you know, on this night, Northeast direction, I saw this orb. This documentation says something like, why is this happening? What does this mean? Why me? You know, these big, profound questions. There must be a more important reason behind this. So he asks these questions, and then he walks back outside, and there's an orb hovering above a power line. So he's looking up at this, and he realizes there's an owl on the power line. So he's looking at the owl. And the owl's looking at the orb, and then they're all kind of, it seems like all three are kind of checking each other out. You know, the owl's checking him out, the owl's checking the orb out, the, you know, the orb is kind of, you know, seems to be very aware of this whole thing. So the important part of that is that there was a, like an internal questioning, you know, why me? What does it all mean? Yeah. And then, in a way, an answer is the wrong way to put it, because it's certainly not an answer, but, but he has a follow-up experience a minute later, less than a minute later, of an owl and an orb together. An owl, the symbolic totem of these, you know, like it, it, I don't state it clearly in the book, and it's interesting because I almost feel like I've come to a, a deeper genesis in the year that the book has been out, where the owl, I feel, is a the totem animal of the transformational process. And and it's not an easy transformation. You know, some transformations are easy, right? You know, you mm -hmm. you you just become an adult, right? And there's like there's things that happen along the way and maybe it's a struggle, but you know, so that transformation just happens naturally. The transformational process of a more profound and spiritual process or transformation that takes place. And I feel that the owl is the is the totem of that process, mm -hmm. of that transformational process. Yeah, I, I can totally see that after getting through the book and all the stories that are in it. But man, great time talking to you, Mike. You really have secured yourself as the king of owl weirdness. <laughs> well, it's actually been, I mean, it's funny because I haven't said this before because you're not the first person. And I said, it did not, I did not pick this. It picked me. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, well, before we go, please remind the people where they can get your book, follow up on your blog, or contact you with any of their own related stories. Um, I'm easy to find. You can just Google my name, Mike Cleland Owls. Um, I am not only the first thing that comes up, I'm like the first 10 things that comes up. Oh, excuse me, I'll rephrase that. You can just Google UFOs and owls, and I'm the first 10 or so things that come up on that list. My blog is hiddenexperience.blogspot.com. You can just Google my name and Hidden Experience, and it'll come right up. From there, you can get the book. The book's available on Amazon. Um, it has been selling remarkably well, given that it's kind of a niche markety little esoteric thing. And it's also kind of an intimidating book. I, I, I made a terrible mistake in a way by making such a thick book because it's a little intimidating to hold in your hand. I, I worked hard to make the writing engaging, and so it zips along. But um, at the same time, I really couldn't figure out what to pull out. Uh, yeah, so the book is available, and yeah, either of those places, you can Google my name or Google Owls and UFOs. It'll come up. Very cool. Well, I had a great time. Hopefully, we can do it again in the future. Any other strange subjects on your horizon? You mentioned you were working on a follow-up book, I believe, right? Well, the follow-up book is again on owls. So this is the follow-up book is the, is the longer, more complex stories that I just simply could not fit into the first book. I had a collection of them, and they are... Um, I mean, I've got a lot of them. So I've got about 16. The book should read as a, like a book of short stories. It'll probably be a little bit under 200 pages, so a much more modest book than this big fat book here on my desk in front of me now. And that will just be called um, Stories from the Messengers, and it'll be a companion to this. So they should sit on the, on the shelf side by side as a nice, tidy couple. So if you've read one, you know, the next one should be a, you know, keep your interest. And yeah. I think it'll be a standalone book where you don't really need to read the thick one in order to read the thin one. Nice. Well, I look forward to that, and definitely thanks for talking to me today. I couldn't have done it without you, and take care, my good man. Thank you so much. This was great. You got it. All right, people. Mike Clellan, closing out the month of January. 
I think he covers some interesting ground, right? Owls are one of the most fascinating animals, and association with shamanism and aliens seems to be pretty established. And I just think it's a good return to the paranormal side of the coin. THC has been pretty political lately. The whole world has, really. And it's good to take a little bit of a breather. But I'd say this is definitely a worthy higher side style exploration. Big thanks to Mike for being here and for doing all the work putting this together. I don't have too much to add here, but of course, if you like the first hour, the Plus Show got into conspiratorial angles, Bohemian Grove, the hidden owl symbol on the dollar bill, connections to Athena, told, of course, some more great owl-related stories, and Chris Knowles, actually, that we all know and love. He makes an appearance in Mike's book with his own connections to the material. We got into the trickster elements at play. And one of my favorite parts, we got into Bill Hicks' UFO sighting. Mike spoke to his friend Kevin Booth at length in person. So we got to hear a pretty close to firsthand account of a shared UFO experience with Bill Hicks. Talked about the connection with mushrooms, sacred spaces and crop circles, charged areas and the owl. And of course, my own owl-related sinks when preparing for this interview. So, a lot of good stuff. Sign up for Plus if you're interested in the second hour of this interview and all the interviews that I do here. If anyone out there has owl stories of their own, I'm sure Mike would love to hear them if he hasn't been burnt out already. But the world is a weird place. What can I say? I've done what I can. Your move, aliens, orbs, and owls. Whatever you are, your fucking move. Woke up this morning with light in my eyes and then realized it was dark outside it was light coming down from the sky i don't know who Must be those strangers that come every night Whose saucer-shaped light put people uptight Leave blue-green footprints that glow in the dark I hope they get home alright Won't you please take me along? I won't do anything wrong. Hey, Mr. Spaceman, won't you please take me along the high side? Woke up this morning. in my beard my toothpaste was smeared I opened my window they written my name said so long we'll see you again hey Mr. Spaceman won't you please take me Hey 
Hey guys, thanks for listening to the first hour of the Higher Side Chats podcast with me, Greg Carlwood. If you don't know, there is a second hour to all the episodes we do around here. Generally, we're able to get a lot deeper into the topics and ideas that a guest is about. So if you enjoyed what you've heard from THC for free, consider signing up at the thehiresidechatsplus.com to get the second hour of the five shows I put together each month. I never really wanted to be a paid subscriber podcast, but I really hate the idea of spending airtime promoting some product that's completely unrelated and telling you the best way to support the show is to buy an audiobook or new underwear by mail or something crazy like that. So instead, if you like the show, double your time with it for five bucks a month and let's cut out all the other shit. It's half the price of a movie ticket and you get at least an extra five hours of show a month. Collectively, it keeps us stable and it frees me from wasting your time with anything but the show you came to listen to. It's really the only way for an independent, one-man show to make it, and I do what I can so that it's worth your while. Since we started this, I've always tried to use the subscriptions to improve the podcast and make signups more advantageous. It started with just a second hour for the main show, but now we've got a nice forum going where people can get deeper in conversation about the episodes with other listeners submit a candidate in the guest request thread, or share their own personal projects to get out of the soul-crushing 9-to-5 cog-in-the-wheel life on the entrepreneur's thread. The forum and the plus comments are always the first places I try to go for listener engagement, but it does get harder as the show gets more popular. Because of that, there's also a direct messaging feature that you can use to reach me through the plus site also. But beyond the form, if you like any of the music I've used for THC, most of it I've hired artists to make, and I provide it all as free downloads to Plus members too. So if you like a particular song you've heard close the show out recently, come get the MP3. I should also mention that if you don't like the idea of paying $5 recurring every month, I get that. You can buy three months, six months, or a year up front and just be done with it. I have plenty of listeners who send checks and money orders to the P.O. Box too, I try to make it as easy for people as I can, and you can read more about it on the sign-up page. Also, be sure to check out the FAQ help page on the Plus site if you have any questions or concerns about how to listen to a password-protected show on your devices. I've highlighted a lot of great solutions, and one of those would be the iPhone app that just recently hit the Apple App Store. A super kind and talented listener made it for us, and you can use it to stream or download either the free or the Plus show. If you're on Android, I'd use Pocket Casts or Podcast Addict and subscribe to the feed manually that way. I also try to throw in occasional bonus shows or Q&A shows, and I've got a few other weird ideas I might get to try out soon. But I give you all I can for five bucks, and I hope you'll at least give it a shot if you've listened to a few free shows and you find them unique or valuable. I know there's a lot of podcasts out there, and I'm just one of them. But if you have any questions, concerns, or comments about any of this, please get in touch with us at the Higher Side Chats team at gmail.com. I also wanted to plug the Higher Side newsletter I'm going to be putting out, totally free for anyone who wants to sign up at the main internet website for the show, thehiresidechats.com. You can also get on that email list through the Higher Side Chats Facebook page. There's a button there as well. But the reason I'm doing this is because I get tons and tons of emails after a show goes up asking me about how I feel about a particular guest or topic, and the wrap-up isn't always the best place to do that, especially if I have anything negative to say. Sometimes the dust needs to settle, sometimes I need to hear feedback from you guys first. There are a lot of factors, but I usually have something to communicate to you, and I just don't get to do it. So on the first of the month, I plan to send out a little newsletter with my thoughts about the five shows the previous month, and talk to you about anything else that's on my mind or that's going on. And what's probably most enticing is that I'm going to give you some insight into at least one guest I have coming up in the month, which people have been begging for some posted schedule for a long time. I personally think I'd like the surprise. But sign up for the Higher Side newsletter. It's free. It comes out on the first of the month, and I won't waste your time with any other emails. And that's it. I appreciate you listening. I try to give alternative ideas and guests a fair shake on a high-quality podcast, expose some deep-level conspiracies without the yelling, and I hope to offer some inspiration that even though the system relentlessly suggests you should follow their blueprint to mediocrity, you can do your own thing and live a much happier life despite all the negativity in the world. So go ahead and treat yourself. Isn't it about time?